Welcome to the first module of fallopian tube pathology. I'm Samia Rashid. I'm a breast and gynae pathology fellow at Hamad Medical Corporation. In this module, we will go over the anatomy, histology, and embryology of the fallopian tube and discuss some of the embryological remnants that are commonly found. This is what the female genital system looks like. I have the uterus in the middle. Attached at the corner of the uterus on both sides are the fallopian tubes, blue in color. The fallopian tubes are sort of resting on top of the ovary here shown in pink. And the ovary is hanging by the side of the uterus by the utero-ovarian ligament. The fallopian tube has different parts. The first or the narrowest part, part is the isthmus. Then we have the ampulla, which is the most common side of fertilization. Then is the infundibulum and the fimbria. The fimbria is the part that rests on the surface of the ovary. At around six weeks of gestation in the developing human, there is development of the Wolfian or the mesonephric duct and parallel to it is the Mullerian duct. The Wolfian duct is the system that gives rise to male genital organs like seminal vesicles, epididymis, vas deferens, and ejaculatory duct. On the other hand, the Mullerian duct is what the female reproductive organs originate from like the uterus, fallopian tubes, cervix, and upper two-thirds of vagina. Based on the genetic makeup of the embryo and the preferred sex, the one system, it grows fully, and the other one involutes. This is what the normal fallopian tube cross-section looks like. Now, at many places, whenever the bilateral tubal ligation is performed, a part of the fallopian tube is sent for histological examination to make sure that the ligation was complete. And this is what we see in a busy lab on a daily basis. So inside, I have the epithelium, then I have the muscular layer, and on the outside is serosa. For me to be able to say that this was complete transaction of fallopian tube, I should see all the layers. The mucosa or epithelium of the fallopian tube is composed of basically two types of cells. One is the ciliated columnar cells and the second is the secretory cells. Also found are the intercalated cells. Now these are the cells that are sort of standing out and there is a lot of debate regarding the origin and function of these cells. The ciliated cell, they help in propagation of the sperm from the fallopian tubes towards the uterus and the secretory cells are believed to have some secretions that help in the propagation of the sperm and egg. Then in the muscular layer, there are three smooth muscle layers, the innermost oblique, the middle circular, and the outermost longitudinal. On the outside is the simple mesothelial layer. This is my humble attempt at demonstrating the fimbriated end of the fallopian tube. Now, the fimbriated end of the fallopian tube is an open end. So it is, it's open from, the, from one side. So this is the outside and we know the outside is serosa, but the inside is also visible because this is open and this is black in color. This will be the epithelium of fallopian tube. So at many places of the fimbria, this is what we see. I have the ciliated fallopian tubule lining here and adjacent to it is the mesothelial lining. I think this is a nice example that on one side is the inner lining, the, the fallopian tube epithelium, and next to it is the mesothelial lining. And this is from the fimbriated end. Now, so much discussion of this because it is believed that the fallopian tube and peritoneal junction is a potential site of carcinogenesis. And we will go over this later on. Now I will discuss some of the common benign remnants or the embryologic remnants that we commonly see in the fallopian tube. So usually whenever we receive a fallopian tube adjacent to it, there is some fibroadipose tissue. And uh, quite often we find these kind of structures. Some here are cystic and some they look like glands. Another picture of it. Now it is important to notice here that I don't have any 
any stroma surrounding these glands, also no hemorrhage. Why? Because whenever I see these kind of glands, I'm alerted, I'm looking for endometriosis, but no hemorrhage here and no stroma here. So this is just benign mesonephric duct remnant. Now, I'll take you back to the embryology of a fallopian tube. Remember when we discussed that we have the Mullerian duct system and we have the uh, Wolfian duct system. And Wolfian is also called mesonephric. So while the mesonephric duct system in females, in, it involutes, but sometimes these remnants, they remain. And it is important for us to know that about the characteristics of these remnants because we don't want to confuse them with endometriosis and also in rare cases these can give rise to carcinoma again we will go over this in the second module interesting stuff coming up so um, the fallopian tube uh, epithelium can undergo transitional or metaplastic change just like any other epithelium shown here is one of the most scary metaplastic change, which is the transitional metaplasia. I found this one scary because it, it can look quite a lot like the serous intertubule carcinoma, but there is no atypia, no high mitosis. So this is just metaplastic transitional change. Also, we can see squamous metaplasia and secretory metaplasia, all kinds of metaplasias in the fallopian tube. Ah, paratubal cyst, so common, so common in the fallopian tube. Pretty much you will see them every other day. So these are cystic structures. They range in size from just a few millimeters to centimeters and lined by low cuboidal epithelium. Sometimes these are filled with secretions, but completely benign. Now, this is one question that I believe all consultants, all pathology consultants, they love asking you about it. Sort of a cystic gland-like structure. And in the lining, I have these cells with grooved nuclei. So they would love to ask you that this coffee bean nuclei, what does it mean? And this is just a Walthart cell nest, completely benign finding also very common and it has nothing to do with granulosa cell tumor of the ovary, which also has coffee bean nuclei. So yeah, something to remember there. Hydrocelpings, simply put, is dilation of the fallopian tube. This is associated with inflammatory diseases of the fallopian tube, quite often with pelvic inflammatory disease and occlusion of the fallopian tube. Another very interesting case. So a lady comes with positive pregnancy test, abdominal pain. Uh, however, in the ultrasound, there is no intrauterine pregnancy. So you try start the uh, clinician, they start looking for pregnancy anywhere else. And the first side they should be looking at is the adnexal area. And usually, like in this case, they found this nodule. When they removed the nodule, like nodular thing in the fallopian tube, they found here villus, villus structures. And this very basophilic structure, it looks like it try, it's trying to form something, an organ or something. So, and this is inside the fallopian tube. Still, there is some intact mesothelial layer here, but the rest of it is just full of hemorrhage. Why? Because most of the uh, uh, tubal pregnancies, they present with hemorrhage. So this is a case of a tubal pregnancy. If you find chorionic villi, it is just enough to make the diagnosis of ectopic tubal pregnancy. If you find an embryo, do gross description. If there is any lesion in, in such a scenario that the pregnancy test is positive, but nothing inside the uterus. So try to sample maximum of, of the tissue that was sent. And more than 95 of the ectopic pregnancies are in the fallopian tube. 
The reason behind uh, ectopic pregnancy, it is that any disease process that alters the normal tubal anatomy seems to increase the frequency. So if there's any lady who had it once, it should be properly followed up to make sure it doesn't happen again. This is a change that we see in pretty much all organs of the body whenever a woman is pregnant and in some cases when she's taking exogenous hormones. So you see that these cells, which are stromal cells, they have these fluffy border and they have this uh, edematous look to them. And this is what we call the decidual change. Decidual change happens mostly in pregnancy. In the event that a lady is taking exogenous hormones, we see this change in the uterus, in the endometrial stroma, but rarely it can be seen in other organs as well. In this case here, we have decidual change in the fallopian tube. Another exam favorite question. So uh, this is sort of a perifallopian tube tissue or wall of the fallopian tube. And here I have these cystic structures surrounded by basophilic stroma. And quite often there is hemorrhage. This is endometriosis. But in case you have any doubt, because we saw so many of these embryologic remnants, and sometimes we don't see the stroma and you're just doubting, is it endometriosis or is it not? So to your help is the CD10 stain, which is positive in the stroma, confirming that this is endometriosis. Endometriosis is the presence of endometrial glands and stroma outside the endometrial cavity, usually accompanying hemosiderin laden macrophages. CD10 can help in case you're not sure about the histological findings. And these ladies usually have cyclic pain, bleeding, dysmenorrhea, and dyspareunia. Infertility, increased risk of endometrial and clear cell carcinoma are seen in these cases. And at the end is one lesion which is similar to endometriosis. This is endosalpingiosis. That is the presence of fallopian tube mucosal epithelium, fallopian tube lining epithelium outside the fallopian tube. Now this can be in the, in the adnexal tissue or even it has been reported in lymph nodes. So I have this uh, ciliated cells along with the secretory cells, even some PEG cells. But this finding yet again is completely benign. It does not increase risk for any other lesion. And with that, we have reached the end of the first module. Do let us know if you have any questions.